Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Dusterberg. I'm a senior fellow at the uh, Hudson Institute and also on the advisory board of the Manufacturing Policy Institute at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental um, uh, Affairs at Indiana University. This is a joint uh, program of um, uh, MPI, the Manufacturing Policy Initiative, um, and Hudson. Uh, this is Manufacturing Week. We have a series of four programs uh, with leading experts um, um, starting on Tuesday, going through Friday. The culmination on Friday will be a discussion between representatives of the Biden campaign, uh, Tim Ryan uh, of Ohio, and the um, Trump campaign, Senator Braun of Indiana, and the Libertarian campaign, uh, who is sending a, uh, a professor of economics from Ball State. Uh, yesterday, we uh, talked about the uh, restoring the industrial uh, commons. Today, uh, the discussion will be on spurring innovation. Tomorrow, the discussion uh, will be on enhancing resilience. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's panel, uh, Gil Kaplan. Uh, Gil was one of the uh, founders of the Manufacturing Policy Initiative at Indiana University. He's had a long career in Washington. He's been the um, acting director of import administration. Um, he was undersecretary of commerce for international trade between 2017 and early this year. Um, he's a longtime lawyer at uh, King and Spalding. Um, and he's also a senior fellow uh, this uh, semester at um, the uh, uh, Manufacturing Policy Initiative Program at Indiana. So Gil, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Look forward to a great discussion. Thank you, Tom, uh, for your introduction, and it's great to be here during Manufacturing Week. Um, and I'd like to thank the um, Manufacturing Policy Initiative at Indiana University um, and Hudson Institute for organizing this great event. Our panel on spurring innovation in manufacturing goes to the heart of one of the great challenges our country faces. How do we maintain a strong and growing manufacturing base? How do we make sure that innovation, always one of the greatest strengths in our economy, remains robust and continues to enhance productivity, jobs, and manufacturing global market share? Our exceptional panel will examine these questions today, and I will introduce them briefly and uh, then turn it over to them. <clears throat> I'd like to start by introducing Stephen Azell who drafted a great paper on manufacturing innovation that is on the IU Manufacturing Policy Initiative website. Stephen is Vice President, Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF. He is the co-author with Dr. Robert Atkinson of Innovation Economics, The Race for Global Advantage, and a co-author of Innovate, Innovating a Service-Driven Economy, Insights, Application, and Practice. Mr. Azell has testified on topics including US competitiveness, innovation, manufacturing, and trade policy before the US Congress and the US International Trade Commission. He came to ITIF from Peer Insight and Innovation Research and Consulting firm he co-founded in 2003. John Newfer is president and CEO of the Semiconductor, Semiconductor Industry Association, SIA, where he's responsible for setting and leading the association's public policy agenda and serving as the primary advocate for maintaining US leadership in semiconductor design, manufacturing, and research. Prior to joining SIA, John served as Senior Vice President for Global, Global Policy at the Information Technology Industry Council, ITI. And prior to that, John served for over, over seven years at the Office of the United States Trade Representative, USTR, in Washington, DC. Two years as Deputy Assistant US Trade Representative for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC Affairs, preceded by over five years as Deputy Assistant US Trade Representative for Japan. Next, we'll hear from Taffy Kingscott, Vice President, Strategic Partnerships for IBM Research. 
She is responsible for developing collaborative research partnerships between IBM, industry, academia, and government. Ms. Kingscott is a member of the National Academy of Sciences Innovation Policy Forum and is IBM's alternate member of the Semiconductor Industry Association Board of Directors. She chairs the CTO work group of the SIA, and she is also a member of the Board of Managers of the American Institute of Physics Publishing. Finally, we will hear from Ralph E. Gomery, President Emeritus, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Dr. Gomery received his PhD in mathematics from Princeton University and served as an assistant professor there before joining IBM's research division. And Dr. Gomery ultimately became the IBM Senior Vice President for Science and Technology. He has served in many capacities in government, industrial, and academic organizations. He served on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST, and was a director of the Washington Post Company and the Bank of New York. He also was a trustee of Princeton University. He is the author with the late Professor William Baumol of the MIT Press book, Global Trade and Conflicting National Interests. So this is an incredible panel, and if anybody can uh, find the answer to our questions, this is it, and we'll start with Stephen. Well, thank you so much, Gil, for that kind introduction, and to the Hudson Institute and the University of Indiana for hosting this important series of conferences this week on revitalizing U.S. manufacturing innovation. Well, we certainly know that U.S. manufacturing is critical to the economy, America's some 250,000 manufacturers contribute $2.3 trillion in GDP annually, $1.5 trillion in exports, and employ almost 13% of America's workforce. However, we also know that America's manufacturing sector is underperforming its potential and has done so for some time. Real manufacturing value added actually declined by 13% from 2007 to 2019. The sector's contribution to U.S. GDP has fallen from 16% in 1997 to 11% today, while the number of U.S. manufacturing jobs has fallen by 25% over the past two decades. Moreover, U.S. manufacturing sector productivity actually declined by an average of 0.3% from 2004 to 2016, well below the annual average growth rate of manufacturing productivity of 3.2% recorded from 1987 to 2016. Now in part, that's because US manufacturing patent activity has plateaued since 2015 with innovation intensity or patents granted per $1 billion of R&D investment essentially flat since the year 2015. And the share of US patents going to US manufacturers as a share of all US businesses actually declining by five percentage points over the past 15 years. All of this suggests that the United States needs to get much more serious about introducing policies, both at the federal and state levels, to bolster our manufacturing competitiveness. America needs to understand that it's engaged in a fierce contest for every single factory and every single manufacturing job in the world. Now, the report I tip releases today, Policy Recommendations to Stimulate U.S. Manufacturing Innovation, offers five categories of recommendations. First, develop and regularly update a robust manufacturing innovation competitive strategy at the national level. Second, invest more heavily in advanced manufacturing technology support programs. Three, provide greater financial support for U.S. manufacturers. Four, reform the tax code. And five, invest more in workforce skills development. In total, the report provides over 30 specific policy recommendations. I won't mention them all, but allow me to touch on a few highlights. First, to their credit, both the Obama and Trump administrations did actually articulate serious national manufacturing strategies, just as America's competitors in countries like Germany, China, Britain, and elsewhere regularly do. The next administration must continue this practice, for instance, as called for in the bipartisan Global Economic Security Strategy Act of 2019. As part of a strategic national plan, we must back it up with specific policies and programs to abet the competitiveness of key manufacturing sectors, such as semiconductors and life sciences, 
the former as contemplated in the CHIPS Act, the American Foundries Act, uh, bipartisan legislation on Capitol Hill to support the manufacturing sector, which I'm sure John and Taffy will tell us more about. Secondly, the Manufacturing USA Network of 15 Institutes of Advanced Manufacturing Innovation has played a pivotal role in facilitating and disseminating advanced manufacturing production and process technologies in areas such as 3D printing, digital manufacturing, lightweight composites, biomanufacturing, uh, smart clean energy manufacturing, et cetera. Now the plan initially was for America to build out 45 of these manufacturing institutes of innovation and China has actually copied us and is on their way to doing so, but we stopped at 15. We need to continue to build out the network with federal government provided to support the institutes on an ongoing basis. The Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP, plays a vital role in supporting the innovation potential of America's small manufacturers. 98% of all US manufacturers are SMEs. MEP helps to bolster uh, their ability to compete in the global economy. Unfortunately, countries like Japan invest three times more as a share of GDP in their similar SME support programs, and America invests 25% uh, less as a share of GDP as in 1982 when we launched the program. And the Trump administration has actually called for zeroing out the program in every year. We need to recognize that the MEP program is serious to America's manufacturing ecosystem because our manufacturing sector is only as strong as its smallest companies. We need to reform the tax code. On tax policy, a recent ITIF report found that America ranks 34th out of 39 OECD countries in R&D tax credit generosity. We need to address that and introduce a collaborative tax credit. Lastly, the federal government should commit to a threefold increase in funding for manufacturing workforce skills and retraining programs. The United States invests just one sixth the OECD average in government investment in workforce support programs, one twelfth the level of investment made by countries like Sweden or Germany. How should we fund this? It's estimated that the Trump administration has collected $80 billion in China tariffs. While ITIF doesn't endorse that policy per se, we need to use a substantial set of that money to reinvest in the manufacturing ecosystem of the United States. Coming off decades of underperformance and now threatened third further by the COVID-19 pandemic, it's time for US policymakers to get serious about implementing a comprehensive set of reforms designed to restore America's position as the world's preeminent manufacturing economy. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, John? Thanks, Gil. Uh, great, great report, Stephen. Really enjoyed it. A lot, lot, a lot of great stuff in there. Um, I also want to thank the Hudson Institute uh, and the IE Manufacturing Policy Initiative for hosting this important event. Uh, strengthening U.S. manufacturing is very much on our minds these days, of course. And thank you, Gil, um, for moderating this, this fine panel. Um, so a few baseline facts about semiconductors. First, uh, the U.S. semiconductor industry has captured about half of the global market, and it's been, been that way for decades. Um, and we manufacture in 18 states uh, at roughly 70 fabrication sites, which we call in our industry fabs. Um, it's not just Silicon Valley. As a matter of fact, there's not much silicon being produced in Silicon Valley anymore. It's all around the country. Um, second, uh, semiconductor industry uh, directly employs nearly a quarter million people in the U.S. and supports more than a million uh, U.S. jobs. Um, third, semiconductors are a top five U.S. export. That's right, they're a top five U.S. export and uh, uh, more than 80% of U.S. semiconductor company sales are to customers overseas. Um, we maintain cons consistent trade surpluses in semiconductors, including with major trading partners such as China. Fourth, uh, innovation in our industry has a long history of taking place at a breathtaking pace. So uh, it, it should come as no surprise that our industry is one of the most research intensive industries in the world, investing roughly 20% of our revenues every year in R&D, right up there with the pharmaceutical industry. Most importantly, semiconductors are the brains of modern electronics. They enable advances in medical devices and healthcare, communications, computing, transportation, clean energy, and technologies of the future such as AI, quantum computing, and uh, wireless networks. And they are very importantly, very, very crit critical to our national security since virtually all war fighting machinery is powered by semiconductors. So uh, 
this industry is critically important to this country for myriad reasons. And while we continue to lead semiconductor design, research, and innovation, our semiconductor manufacturing capability has slipped. SAA recently released a joint report with the Boston Consulting Group, or BCG, to look at this problem. The report underscores the U.S. currently has just 12% of global share of semiconductor manufacturing capacity, down from 37% in 1990. And in the last 10 years, and in the next 10 years, our global share will fall another 20%. Unsurprisingly, most of the semiconductor manufacturing capacity growth will occur in Asia. In fact, roughly three quarters of it does today. China is project, projected to have the world's largest share of chip production capacity by 2030, or nearly 30%. While the US is a highly desirable place to locate fab manufacturing, if you're just looking at access to talent and secure IP environment, the reality is we can't compete in terms of economics. And that's because other competing governments have in place for, have had in place for decades generous manufacturing incentive programs. Our states, our, our states have some incentive programs to be sure, but it's extremely hard for them to compete with deep pocketed nation, national governments, which have long ago made the strategic choice of putting significant incentives in place to attract semiconductor manufacturing. It's just not a level playing field. Building and operating fabs is incredibly expensive. The price tag for building and running a state-of-the-art fab over 10 years can run between 10 to $40 billion. That's the price of a modern aircraft carrier. So this stuff is not cheap. As the BCG report we commissioned estimated total cost of construction and ownership of US-based fabs are 25 to 15% above to 50% above other regions. Government incentives alone directly account for 40 to 70% of the US cost gap. The report modeled three scenarios over the next 10 years. One, we stay on the current trajectory with no additional federal manufacturing incentives. Two, the government provides 20 billion in incentives. And three, the government invests 50 billion in incentives. Under the status quo, the projection is frankly not great. With no additional federal government incentives, our share of global manufacturing capacity will drop to 10%, with the U.S. capturing only 6% of the addressable fab capacity over the next 10 years and building only nine new fabs. Under a scenario in which the U.S. Under, under the scenario in which the U.S. government provides incentives $20 billion, we would see private sector fab capex investment of $174 billion, which would equate to capturing a total of 14% of the addressable global fab capacity and result in a total of 14 new US fabs. This scenario would effectively stabilize the US share global capacity at 12% and stop the historical downward trend. So, under the, under the $50 billion uh, scenario, we'll see private CapEx investment of $279 billion, which would equate to capturing a total of 24% of the total addressable fab capacity and bringing U, the U.S. ranking as the number two global manufacturer of semiconductors and result in the construction of roughly 19 new fabs. This scenario would also turn the tide and actually increase U.S. capacity share to 13 to 14%. Our industry does not want the U.S. government to pick up the entire tab of a fab, but simply to provide grants and tax incentives to make America a more attractive choice for our advanced manufacturing and allow our companies to continue innovating in the U.S. Over the next 10 years, it's projected that semiconductor manufacturing capacity will increase by roughly 56%. We need to get a big share of that construction. We need that manufacturing capacity to be built out here in the US. The partnership between our industry and the US government will provide the incentives necessary to offset government subsidies of our foreign competitors 
these, these incentives would finally level the playing field with other countries' governments that, 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 that they've been offering for decades. Another crucial leg of our advocacy efforts is increased federal investments for basic and applied research. I know Taffy King Scott will dive deeply into this, so I won't dwell on it. But recent SIA research shows each dollar invested by, by the federal government into semiconductor research uh, increases overall US GDP by $16.5. And this is what helps our industry continue leadership by making products more powerful, efficient, and cost effective. Moreover, you can have all the manufacturing in the world based in the US, but if that manufacturing is not contempl contemplated with the best innovations, our industry would be diminished. So we've been working with the administration and lawmakers to create an incentives package to put things into better balance. The package currently being considered would create grants to our companies for partial assistance on capital expenditures, expenditures to build fabs domestically. So the good news is Congress overwhelmingly passed legislation this summer supportive of our industry in both the House and the Senate versions of the National Defense Act, and we are working hard to make sure that legislation remains in the final package that goes into law, hopefully later this year. And of course, the next big push is going to be to get appropriations, fun, uh, funds appropriated for, these, for, for this legislation. We'd also like to see an investment tax credit added to the incentives, and we are working on that as well. Overall, we are hopeful we'll get progress on this initiative. The U.S. has fallen behind in semiconductor manufacturing, and the mood on the Hill and the administration seems largely favorable to shouldering in with industry to finally address this very real problem. Thanks, Gil. Thank you, John. Um, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Taffy now. Okay. Well, first, thank you very much, Gil, and to the University of Indiana and to the Hudson Institute for inviting me to be with you today. Um, I'd like to pick up where John just left off with respect to manufacturing and research and um, go in a little bit more deeply on some of the research initiatives that are included in the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, and also why it is so critically important that we do this. Um, as John mentioned, the cost of building facilities in this critical industry, semiconductor industry, is astronomical. It's not just the cost of uh, capital expenditures, but it's also the operating costs. And we can't um, overlook that the operating costs is a part of this equation for um, improving the, the situation the industry finds itself in today. So um, it's our view, and I believe the industry strongly believes it, that we have to have investment in not only manufacturing, but in the preceding uh, areas of the of the ecosystem. We have to have investment in basic research, in advanced uh, research, advanced development, and prototyping. Because if we don't do that, then we won't have anything to manufacture at the leading edge. You can't just manufacture at the leading edge if you don't have the parts of the puzzle in place before you get to the manufacturing piece of it. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the um, NDAA and some of the provisions that it, it um, includes. Um, importantly, the legislation does provide for incentives for um, incentives and grants for manufacturing, development, and prototyping in the semiconductor area. And this would be done as a uh, public-private partnership, so public sector and private sector together to address this really important national need. Um, the agencies involved are the ones you might necessarily think of: Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, Department of Energy. Um, all these are really critical, and the funding is to be used for not just building a facility, but for um, expanding or modernizing current facilities. And our hope is that that language is um, broad enough to include the operating expenses, because they're very, very significant to operate these facilities. Another piece of the legislation that's really, really significant is the first time I've been doing this stuff 30 years, and I've never seen any activity like what's being proposed now with respect to the National Semiconductor Technology Center. Um, this is a proposed center that would have a couple of really important characteristics. It would be, first off, it would be industry-led. 
and work in conjunction with government. We set up in a public-private consortium, but this industry leadership is really critical because it's really in the industry where people have the experience, the know-how, the talent, um, and the uh, ability, the leading ability to do advanced development, prototyping, and manufacturing. I mean, we have terrific federal labs, but the capabilities of the federal lab is not really semiconductor development and manufacturing it's in other areas. And so we need to have this be industry-led. Another aspect of this um, National Semiconductor Technology Center has to do with packaging and including packaging in the mix of technologies to be um, addressed. And this is so critical because I know this sounds kind of wonky, but the fact of the matter is we're getting to the end of Moore's Law. Moore's Law means that we've been able to increase the performance of semiconductors by reducing the line width, the dimensions of the circuits. But you can't get any smaller than an atom. So all of that capability and know-how that's been applied to chip development and manufacturing has not really been applied to packaging. Packaging was just, well, slap them all together and off we go. But that's not going to work anymore. So we have to take that same know-how and capability that's been applied to the chip creation and apply it to the package in which the chips are inserted so that we can increase the performance of the package, not only increase the performance of the chip, so that when you actually take the package and you put it into a system, the whole thing works more effectively. So there's a lot of language and hopefully funding in this NSTC to bring together chip development, prototyping, manufacturing, and packaging. We think it should be under industry leadership and of course with our government partners. Um, there's another piece of this puzzle that has to do with the uh, work done at NIST. There's an old saying in semiconductor stuff that if, if you can't measure it, you can't make it. So when we are working at the um, microscopic level of dimensions, we have to have the tooling and the, and the ability to measure so that we can actually manufacture. So that's a traditional role for NIST, also to do materials characterization. It's kind of surprising. If you look at the number of elements that we use today, the elements from the periodic table that we use today in semiconductor creation versus 20 years ago, it's, there's no comparison. And so we need to know how these materials are characterized. And of course, NIST has a critical role in developing standards. So having a packaging program at NIST, it is classic job, classic work, great, is great. This legislation also calls for a manufacturing institute. Stephen mentioned we were supposed to start with 45 and we've only done 15. Well, let's make this one be the 16th, right? Let's get it done, get her done, as they say. And finally, uh, somebody somewhere got a great, great idea, which was let's have a real strategy. You know, we've got a huge piece, huge puzzle out here. It's like a, you know, it's like 52 pickup right now. There isn't any interagency connection that really works. It's in a public, in a public domain that's developed with industry, with government, with academia, as to how we should invest our critical resources in this industry. So developing a national semiconductor strategy is a big, um, step forward and it's including legislation so we are all systems go on trying to make this legislation and the funding associated with it come to pass so thanks a lot and look forward to questions thank you thank you taffy um let's turn it over to ralph gomery uh, i'd like to join the others in thanking you gill and the hudson institute for, for doing this. It's something that is badly needed and uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're tackling it. Yeah. Uh, I think my, uh, I can only say I agree with the various positive uh, recommendations that you've all made, right? But I think I want to point out there is a lot of opposition, right? And it's from, you, you're all gonna help companies to succeed, but these companies don't 
uh, take as their goal, uh, making things better in general in manufacturing, right? In fact, many of them take as their sole goal the short range contribution to shareholder profit. Okay. And that is so that you guys are all making the surroundings better for them, but they are trying to use those surroundings to make as much short range profit as possible for the shareholders. Whether that is done in a way that helps the enterprises you're talking about or actually counteracts them is not, they don't care, right? And so many of these propositions, you know, to try and keep up with China by spending this and that, will be opposed by these corporations. And that has been their history, all right, so far. Okay. So there's the surroundings, which I'm totally with you. But within the corporations themselves, they would rather get a profit now by building a plant in China with all the subsidies they can get right away, with the mispriced currency, with the tremendous uh, subsidies uh, that are given by the Chinese government. They may build the plant for you, right? And this in many, many areas. And uh, it is, it is, it's not a partisan thing. It's basically stems from the fact that companies are run by their boards of directors. The boards of directors are uh, um, are elected by money, and the money comes to a considerable extent from the uh, shareholders. And the shareholders of the company are disproportionately very wealthy. Right? So they are interested in, in uh, increasing that, that wealth. Right? And um, let, let me tell you the force of this by, by a, little, a little story. Um, when I was still in IBM, we, we won a Nobel Prize in physics, and we did it in, in something that was very applied. We invented a new kind of microscope that enabled us to see the position of the atoms on silicon, on the surface, because it's different there than inside. This was very important to be able to do. Now, it happened that the, the method was called a scanning tunneling microscope applied to a whole bunch of things. And so, who well, no, you know, two years later, the guys won the Nobel Physics Prize. So I went to my boss, who was the CEO of IBM, and, and well, the first one who really reacted in the new way toward the goals of the corporation. The older goals of IBM were mixed, all right? We want to do something for our shareholders. We want to do something for the people who work here want to do something for the company and you compromise between all those things. But in the new world in which shareholders were primus, had primacy, things have become different. And I said to him, you know, and it, I'm not gonna give his name because he was, he was typical of the new, right? I said, we ought to publicize this. You know, it's good for the company to win a Nobel Prize that makes it easier for us to hire first rate people and all that stuff. And he wouldn't do it. He said no. And he was right. Because in fact, publicizing that sort of thing would have had a negative effect on the stock price. And the stock price was his goal to raise. And why, why, why would it have that effect? I can only uh, tell you that I had experience with that later when I was responsible for one and a half billion dollars at the Sloan Foundation. And occasionally I had, I had a financial uh, uh, person 
of course, doing that, but occasionally I would have lunch with the people we invested with. And they were not really interested in the performance in any long range sense of a company. They wanted it to do well right now, this quarter preferably, or by the end of the year at most, okay? That was a short range thing that was built in by the way they in turn were rewarded, right? Hedge fund people are not long range investors. Okay? And so we have tremendous forces at work on our companies from the inside that are inherently short range and we are competing with people who are willing to take a very long range view, okay? And we have to change that if we're gonna be successful uh, in having productive manufacturing. And I'll say more later, okay? Yeah. Well, thank you, Ralph, and thank all of you for these incredible presentations. Um, I only have 23 questions, so I'll get right to them. <laughs> the first one, I'll just tell a very brief anecdote. When I was in the Reagan administration, this is a long time ago before many of you were probably working in this area, we thought we would have a industrial policy. It wasn't something that ultimately went very far interagency, but we met and we, we said, well, what, what should the industrial policy be? And the first thing we said was, well, we absolutely cannot do anything in consumer electronics because the Japanese dominate that and it's useless. We wanted to be realistic, you know, uh, adult in the way we looked at it. And then, you know, a few years later, Apple uh, came to the fore. They already existed, but no one in that room had heard of Apple or cared about it. And they became the most successful consumer electronics history uh, uh, company in history. And uh, they don't make TVs, I guess, but they make just about everything else consumers use. The other thing I'd say is in that room when we talked about the future, no one said anything about the internet. The internet did exist at that time, it was around 1987, but nobody sat around and said, well, we need to help, you know, the government needs to help develop uh, a search engine or streaming video or something, the things that are dominating the world now. So my question is, if we do have a national industrial policy, and, and e each of you are experts in some industry, but in the government, it will really have to look at the whole scope of the US economy. How would we set up such a policy in a way that would not be counterproductive? How would we not do the most obvious things or the things where people are pushing us who have a lot of political influence? How can the federal government set something up like this that would really be effective. And um, I'd ask everybody to keep their answers short so we can get through a number of different uh, areas, but I, I'll just start it with uh, whoever wants to raise their hand. Hey Gil, let me, let me make a first shot at this. Um, sure. In answer to your question, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not smart like um, uh, Stephen Azell is who could think all this stuff through. But I can say you can't have a policy where one size fits all. Um, what, what Ralph was referring to about companies uh, have, have kind of being doomed to uh, short-term goals, and you know this, this is a problem that we face with, with countries with industrial policy for sure. But if you look at the semiconductor industry, we're, we, are, we are doomed to a long, taking long-term bets. It's when it costs $30 billion to, to build a fab or a year or two to develop a new chip, you're not thinking short term, you're, you're thinking over the horizon. So the same kind of policy solutions, industrial policy solutions that would be suitable for one industry wouldn't be suitable for, for another. And I, I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment on that too, Gil. You know, I made the point about the National Semiconductor Strategy and 
So how do we get this done? We build a strategy that you might think of as like a portfolio management strategy. You have a short-term strategy, you have a medium-term strategy, and you're over, over the horizon. And you do different activities at different places in the um, in the portfolio. Just you you don't put all your eggs in one basket in your stock portfolio if you have one. You put it across it. You diversify your portfolio, and that's what we need to do. We need to step up and recognize that the world has changed. We have to think more differently and act differently than we have in the past, or the world will pass us by. And that's simply the way it is. It's a fact. You know, and, and actually, you talked about you know the history of the internet and search engine. That's actually quite an instructive case. You think back to the year 2003, when France financed a company, stood it up from whole cloth called Quero. Now, Quero was the French-appointed, quote unquote, Google killer that was going to be their response to Google. Well, let's look back to Google. How did Google get started? It actually, you trace the lineage back, it was a $2.5 million research grant from the National Science Foundation to these two graduate kids at Stanford, Sergey Page and Larry uh, Bren, and they funded the original um, search algorithm called Backer up at the time. The US government didn't set out when the NSF was investing in these two kids to say, we're going to build the world's leading search engine industry. But we said, you know, we're going to drill some holes. We're going to make some bets. We're going to fund innovative research at U.S. companies and industries. And that, over time, will spill over. And we've seen this time and again. Any, I mean, if you look at the history of, of SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research uh, uh, alone, um, you see companies like Genentech, um, Cisco, uh, three, you know, all these companies coming out of it. So uh, the, the broad point to make, I think, is, is to try and distinguish between industrial policy and innovation policy. Industrial policy is bureaucrats sitting down at the table saying which companies, which specific industries do we want to, you know, especially at the company level, that do we want to favor in the national economy? We do better when we say, hey, there are broad sets of technologies on the horizon, robotics, semiconductors, biomanufacturing. How do we coordinate the resources of our society with regard to smart PhD students, with R&D investments, with industry roadmaps in these sectors, and think about the global competitive challenges they face? So it's, it's, it's thinking strategically about partnerships to effectively make our industries more successful in international competition. Um, but the government's not guiding in, in, in that process. It's a collaborative partnership. Uh, Ralph, do you have any comments? or? Well, I, I, I think I'll, I, I would say this, that again, uh, you're all talking about how to make it better for companies. I'm saying that we need something additional. We have to have companies that are thinking about doing something better for the United States, not just for their shareholders, right? So I'm talking about although I endorse all the things you say, and especially uh, the stress on semiconductors, and, and so I'll make a parenthetical remark. Uh, there have been two major revolutions in the last 200 years. The first was the Industrial Revolution, which freed power to be available, right? You didn't have to have donkeys walking in a circle to have some power other than human power. And you ended up with electric power available anywhere, anywhere for anything, right? The second is the, essentially the, the thinking revolution. We have enough semiconductor power now that you can do thinking to, you know, with the proper techniques. Most of what we do, every job, whether it's a waiter, or anything you want to think of, usually combines these two things. There's a physical part and it's available, and now there's a thinking part and it's available. Right? So this is a new world we're in. The importance of this stuff is that we, we, we can now produce more than enough to give everybody uh, a reasonable standard of living. This and economics is still about scarcity. We're moving out of scarcity, right? And it's a new world, and we should keep that in mind. It's that profound a thing. Now, in this new world, major players are the corporations. 
Now, do we want them only to think about short range? Most, I don't think so. And also, we need to restructure them so that the benefits of their activities are not just going to the shareholders. The shareholders uh, are, and this is a fact, of course, already largely fairly wealthy, right? So the, we need to rethink almost everything we expect from corporations, but we're not doing that. We're leaving them alone to, to pursue the goal of shareholder value. I think we should change that as well. Right. So I think we, we should consider having corporations that have in their charters what they're there for and that they are there to balance the interests of different parts of the country, of the different groups in the country. And as was customary, if you look at the statements of the Business Roundtable up to around 1980, that's the way it was. Then we, we shifted and it became shareholder value only. I think we have to consider shifting back for some of our corporations. Yeah, Ralph, in 1982, the National Association of Corporate Boards of Directors uh, changed yeah. their guidance to boards uh, from the previous focus on stakeholder capitalism and that firms had responsibilities to employers, to communities, yes. to owners yeah. and shareholders, uh, just yeah. to maximizing shareholder value. The other day, the Business Roundtable had a study uh, which has to, uh, surveyed uh, uh, Fortune 500 uh, CFOs. 80% uh, yes. said they would cut their R&D in the current quarter so they can meet uh, Wall Street earning targets. I agree yeah. that uh, thinking uh, how we can align the incentives to help companies think more longer term, it would be important for the US economy. But I think also two points. One, we got to recognize there's a set of large companies and small companies in our economy. 40% of mid-Atlantic manufacturers uh, can barely meet their working capital cost. Um, we need to think about innovative programs. Uh, we've called for like a national manufacturing digitalization fund, a pool of money at the federal level that these small companies could tap into so they can implement modernized production processes like AI and digital manufacturing today that they can't afford investments in upfront, but over time, um, ROI of one or two years, and, and it makes them more competitive over, over time. So it's important to think you know, differently about the types of interventions we want to make in the economy. And I guess the, the final broad point I'd make there, essentially what globalization has done is turned nations from price makers into price takers in the global economy. So today, firms go around the world and they say, okay, US, Germany, Israel, China, what do you have to offer us in terms of the best tax policy, regulatory policy, pools of skilled talent or infrastructure? Um, and, 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 and so it's been inverted. Uh, I think what we're starting to see now, though, is, is two things. One, how nations have to manage that response in the global context is through effective national manufacturing and innovation strategies. And secondly, as we have conversations like we're having now with the semiconductor industry, for instance, where they're saying, hey, we need a government partnership now to compete. I, I think it's important then to think about, okay, what, what are the set of trade-offs now? I think it's absolutely appropriate that we invest in supporting this critical manufacturing industry and the jobs and exports it, it supports for the US. And there's a conversation to be had, okay, well, if you're in these programs and the technology gets developed, you know, what percent of that R&D or that manufacturing activity do we need to have a covenant occurs in the United States so we're, we're down to the benefit um, of, our, uh, of, of our workforces. Uh, certainly, we're, we're far from the days of, of where uh, the president of GM said what's good for uh, uh, GM is good for America. But I think there are ways we can constructively align these in terms of recognizing that actually, if we care about American workers, we better well care about American companies. Uh, because at the end of the day, by and large, you know, <laughs> they're the ones that are providing the opportunities for high value out employment in this country. Kathy, I saw you. Were you raising your hand? Yes, I was actually. <laughs> Look, um, <clears throat> I have great respect for my colleagues here on the phone. I mean, on the on the Zoom call. But I got to say a couple things. Number one, um, I think we we're making very broad generalizations. Companies, well, companies are different. Companies differ from company to company. So I don't think it's a, as accurate to make these broad generalizations. Companies do this and companies do that. Boom, no way. Number two. Um, you might recall that I think it was just last year, the Business Roundtable changed its, um, its uh, characterization of the purpose of a company. 
from being, in general, business roundtable companies, from being stake, um, shareholder driven to stakeholder driven. In other words, reverting back to what it had been in the 70s. And I can also tell you from my own experience of 46 years in the IBM company that um, companies are different. And uh, we, at least at this one company, feel very strongly that the purpose is for the stakeholders broadly, whether it's the employees, the, st the stockholders, the shareholders, the communities in which we do business, and our nation. And so I'm only speaking from the point of view of what I've observed for many years in the business community, that there are multiple ways of going about being a good citizen and being a good national citizen and being a good community citizen. So I really think we should be thinking more broadly along those lines because we're committed to doing the right thing for our country and for the global society and for the stakeholders as broadly as we might define them. Let me go to another question. <laughs> we could... Okay, Ralph, go ahead. I'd just like to, to say that I don't take too seriously the statement of the business roundtable. Right? I, th I think it, it, it reflects the fact that the American people really want the stakeholder, uh, not the shareholder thing. And they've said that, but the forces that are acting on the companies have not changed. Right? I, I have been a director of many, many companies and IBM, uh, I think has been somewhat different. Right? It's always had much more of a stakeholder view. Right? But I can just say that uh, that has not been the way it's been in most companies. Okay? And so we need to change, uh, in, and by the way, I, I agree, you know, one company is not like another company, and big companies are not like small companies, and companies in industry A are not like those in B. But I'm saying we've got to revive the reality of uh, stakeholder uh, motivation. Yeah. Let me just uh, try to get one or two more questions in, and then we'll have like a lightning round where everyone can give a, a final comment because we do have a time constraint. So what I'm hearing in this conversation and really all around town and around the country, and I think we'll hear it from all the candidates, is now the manufacturing issues are susceptible only or mainly to a federal government solution. That's where we are. It's not a question of what the companies or the researchers do. We are all now looking for the federal government to step in and take action. Is, is, is that your impression? Is that, is that where we are? I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but it just seems like that's, that's what's going on in just about every industry at this point. John, do you have a, do you have a thought about that? No, you're on mute. You're on mute. I am. First of okay. all, <laughs> yeah, first of all, um, yeah, I mean, at least for our, our sector, we're talking about a partnership in a certain, certain in some targeted areas. I, I, I really think that uh, there's a role for government in facilitating competitiveness in every industry, but the role has to be tailored to the industry. For us right now, uh, we don't have a level playing field when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing. And frankly, when it comes to research in, in semiconductors or basic sciences, you know, our, our government funding has been flat for decades, while other governments, China, Korea, are on an up, upward trajectory. So that's where the government needs to step in to level the playing field. And it has to be done, as Taffy was suggesting, in a very, very close partnership with the private sector. Because, you know, Gil, you worked in government, I worked in government. Government's good at, at governance, but it's kind of bad at picking winners, kind of bad at doing business, and it shouldn't get into that business. I appreciate that. And um, we have about five minutes, so I'm just gonna ask each of you if it's all right to uh, just make any final comments you might have based on our discussion or, um, 
Stephen's paper or other thoughts, and I'll, I'd like you to limit it to you know about a minute from each of you uh, if you do have any final comments. Stephen? On the state question, uh, states play a vitally important role as well in manufacturing policy. In fact, a number of states are actually developing like industry 4.0 or advanced manufacturing strategies. Uh, states like Iowa, Massachusetts, Texas are doing so. Um, also thinking very seriously about the skills part of their economy. And I do want to mention manufacturing workforce skills briefly as my final comments. Um, a recent study by Brookings uh, found that whereas in 2002, just 47% of U.S. manufacturing jobs required a medium to high digital skill level, 82% do so today. Yet despite that, only one in, uh, 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 there are one in six American workers in manufacturing who cannot use basic email or web search tools. Um, we have to recognize that the most fundamental contributor to the competitiveness of American manufacturing is our workforce and uh, increase and bolster our investments in job uh, market training programs there. Thank you. Uh, Taffy? Well, I'll, I'll support what Stephen said about skills being critical, but I'd also go back to your point about government. It's not just the federal government, but we also need to think about what's going on at the state and local level, particularly with, if you're developing facilities and or whether they're research or, or manufacturing, you gotta think about permitting, you gotta think about the speed at which you can actually get something done based on, you've got to get you know, uh, water and environmental permits, you have to get a land permit, land use permits, you have to organize yourself, you have to get suppliers engaged and so on. So it's the whole government, and by that I mean federal, state, local, whole of society, companies, academics, all of us working together, recognizing that we have a real challenge ahead, and it's, we gotta go full steam ahead to retain the quality of life and the leadership that the United States has enjoyed for the last 75 years. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, and then we'll let John have the last word. Right. I'm. I'm so supportive of the things that are proposed. But I want to uh, stress that our corporations need to have a different motivation, some of them, all right? Because they, are, they will be opposing and making it difficult for these wonderful things you're talking about to happen. And that has been their recent history, right? And so change within, in my opinion, has to be considered as well. Thank you, John. You're, you're on mute again. <laughs> That's the problem with working for a tech association. <laughs> yeah, right. So I wanna finish on an optimistic note. Um, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has, has just been a huge challenge for, for us, for the world. But, you know, six months ago, we couldn't, be having this conversation, at least in the semiconductor industry, about these kinds of innovation slash in things that look like industrial policy. I think that the, the COVID crisis is, has really woken our politicians up. It's woken our government officials up to the reality that we all have supply chain vulnerabilities. We need to rebalance those 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 vulnerabilities. And and in our case, I feel like uh, we're going to get you know. It's, as awful as all, all the, 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 the genesis of this was, we're gonna get something good for uh, our industry, for our nation, for the world that's gonna come out of this. And it's gonna be um, kind of thoughtful, kind of rebalancing of supply chains. And um, as Taffy says, some kind of uh, national um, semiconductor uh, strategy, which, which we've, we've long needed. So I, I, and I feel that, that the worm has turned I feel that we're heading in the right direction. I feel that there's a lot of work to do, but um, I'm optimistic, Gil. Great, great. Well, thank you all. I'll just leave with one very brief comment. Um, my next question was gonna be on resilience, but not resilience as it's used, resilience in manufacturing, but I, w I, w I wanted to ask a question about the resilience of manufacturing policy, because if we're gonna start this effort, and I've heard some of these conversations many years ago, we need some way to make sure there's a consistent long-term manufacturing policy. So all these great ideas uh, are put into effect and then are, are, are monitored to make sure they're working right, because obviously the first things we do are not gonna be perfect and 
you know, we need a long-term manufacturing policy um, initiative, so to speak, to make sure we're doing these things in a way that really works. With that, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I'd like to thank all of you. You were a great panel. Uh, I wish we had another hour, but we don't. So I look forward to these discussions uh, in another uh, forum, perhaps, or another time. And I, I thank you all for your time and, and your, your wonderful ideas. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.